want to welcome everybody to happy hour at Gorongosa National Park. And in fact, I'm going to start off with a little toast here. <laughs> it, is indeed, um, it is indeed happy hour. In fact, the sun has set in tears, Paula, in Gorongosa National Park. But of course, many of you are joining us from time zones all across the world. So for some of you, it may be breakfast, it may be lunch, or just some sort of a, a break time. And um, I'm just so pleased that all of you could join us to celebrate this amazing place and learn a little bit about this park that has a, a very strong connection to the Half Earth Project um, and to the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. We're so lucky today because we have three special uh, uh, they're guests for us, but of course they're resident in the park. So um, even with these extraordinary events that are going on in the world right now, um, we have Peter Nazrecki, who is co-director of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Laboratory based in the park. Um, and Peter is also our inaugural Half Earth Chair. And then importantly, Peter is joined by two Mozambican scientists in training, Ricardo Guta, who is our, our Half-Earth Scholar, and Norina Vincente. Um, and they both have their own um, amazing stories to tell. Now, we're gonna get started with a few uh, questions um, that, that I'll, I'll introduce, um, but your questions are really the most important thing. So please use the uh, uh, comment feature on Facebook and use the Q&A feature on Zoom to send us your questions and we're going to try and take as many of them as possible. And then I'm, I'm also joined here by uh, Paula Ehrlich, who's the president and CEO of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. And I think it's fair to say that Paula is a co-founder, co-instigator of the Half Earth project, which is, of course, inspired by uh, the book by E.O. Wilson by the same name. And um, later in the program, Paul is going to come to come in and tell us a little bit more about our connection with Gore and Ghost and a little bit more about our Chairs and Scholars uh, program. So I hope you're all... Hi, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, good to see you, Paula. Um, so uh, let's just jump in and get started. Um, and, uh, and, and hear from these amazing folks who are in the park. Now, as I mentioned, uh, as you can see, it's dark in Gorongosa National Park. The sun has set. Um, there's a full moon, but my understanding is there's some clouds. And we have Peter and, uh, uh, Peter and, and Irina and um, uh, Ricardo are in front of a light trap, which hopefully we're gonna show you some interesting things. But Peter, I wanted to set the scene a little bit by asking you to tell us um, about what's around you in the park. Give us a little sense of the amazing landscape. And if we were roaming around in the park during the day, um, what sort of landscapes would we encounter in Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique? All right. Well, first of all, uh, hi, Dennis and Paula. It's really good to see you. Um, I'm happy that we can have this, 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 this chat. Uh, it is, on one hand, it's a bit unfortunate that it's, that it's so dark here, so we cannot actually show you around. But at the, at the same time, this is a very exciting time for biologists because night is the time when things come out, the interesting things. Uh, if we were here during the day, what you would see is um, a typical uh, uh, lowland open woodland or savanna. Uh, we are, Gorongosa uh, is situated at the bottom and the southernmost tip of the great African Rift Valley. Um, so we are at the, essentially at the, at the sea level and the elevation here is, is uh, relatively very, very low and the terrain is flat. So you can literally fly uh, uh, almost for hours over this, uh, over this landscape within the, the, the great Rift Valley and what you will see is different kinds of savanna. Some are, are, are pure grassland, some are marshes. Uh, at this time of year, they would be covered with water almost completely. And then we have woodlands. So we are, uh, Narina, Ricardo, and I are in the main camp of Gorongosa uh, called Chitengo. Uh, this is where the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity 
uh, lab is situated, we are actually standing right in front of it. Um, and so we are in the middle of this typical uh, Gorongosa woodland with uh, the dominant trees here would be acacias, several different species of acacias. One of them is known as the fever tree. It's a beautiful, beautiful tree with this bright yellow bark. Um, so uh, it, and it's a relatively dry uh, type of habitat. We receive here in Chitango about uh, 700 millimeters of rain every year, which is actually for Africa, it's not that bad, uh, but it's definitely not a humid environment. Uh, we are here at the end of the rainy season. So every now and then it still rains a little bit, but we are slowly entering the dry season. So the rains will, will become less and less frequent. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the vegetation is, is, is very lush and green. Uh, there's a, a, a large, uh, uh, large numbers of insects still, uh, amphibians and reptiles. So it's a, it's, it's a booming place uh, in terms of, of its biodiversity. I don't know if you can hear it, but there are crickets all around us. Uh, you know, if you were standing here, the, the level of insect noise is, is pretty much as, almost as high as the, the level of, of, of me speaking here in terms of decibels. That's, that's a great, you're painting a great picture there, Peter. You know, my understanding is, I think you've told me before that the park represents nearly, has nearly every possible ecological landscape that you can encounter in Southern Africa. Um, that is, that is correct. Uh, that is correct. We have virtually every uh, type of ecosystem or landscape that occurs in this part of the continent. Uh, the only one that we do not have, it's a true desert, simply because there are no true deserts in the eastern part of, or sou southeastern part of Africa. But we have everything ranging from alpine or, or Afro-montane Afro meadows on Mount Garangosa, through a belt of true uh, rainforest, uh, through close canopy uh, woodland, called, which we call here Miombo, uh, we have another type of woodland, which is called Mopani. We have more open woodland. We have grasslands, uh, and and then we have marshes and a lot of a lot of water. Uh, Gorongosa is a very much uh, a water dri driven ecosystem, extremely dynamic. Uh, the water dynamics here is is just incredible. It changes uh, literally from day to day with the arrival of the of the rainy season. Uh, one of the key features of Gorongosa is a big lake called Lake Urima, which normally uh, during the dry season, it covers about 20 square kilometers. During the rainy season, it expands to over 200 square kilometers. So actually the spot where I'm standing, you cannot see it unfortunately, but the entire lab and all the buildings here are elevated because sometimes the water comes here to, to the camp and if you wanted to move between the buildings, you either have to wade in the water or take a little boat and, and, <laughs> and go among them. That doesn't last very long, yeah. but it does happen. Well, I wanted, there's a really important aspect of this park. So, so, so we, we know that it's a diverse landscape, therefore likely home to lots of biodiversity. There's another important aspect of the park and that's its ties to the community and its role both in the region and in the nation. And I thought maybe this would be a good opportunity to hear a little bit from um, Ricardo and Norina about um, what that community aspect means to them, what the meaning of the park is um, for Mozambicans. Um, so maybe a, just a quick introduction um, from each of you uh, and, and if you have any comments about that. Marina, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, my name is Norina Vicente, and here in Gorongosa National Park, I work as a zoological technician. So um, the park is linked uh, with the community because um, we know that we cannot protect just the, the, the biodiversity. So we need to combine uh, the both things because just protect biodiversity without informing people that all are already uh, here. So it's meaning that we are not putting a lot of effort. So what we need to do is to combine uh, biodiversity, how we are going to protect, but also educate people. So for that, we use uh, different programs. So uh, one of the program is uh, um, Gale Clubs. Uh, we have also uh, 
more than uh, more than 50% of the workers here belongs to the buffer zone. So that helped them to have uh, uh, an employer and also get some money. And we, when they have this money, it's meaning that they they already have uh, opportunity to come here to work mm -hmm. each day, and also that reduce the pressure uh, with uh, fauna or Florida. So that is uh, one thing. But also we know that communities here, for example, for girl clubs, uh, we know that in rural areas, uh, women used to marry very, very earlier. So we are talking about women of 10, sometimes 15 years. So when she born, she already have a husband. The father say, okay, you can go to school, but you need to know that after finish grade seven, you will marry with someone. So with this program, we are allowing to uh, keep girls in their schools. So we are giving them, them opportunities. And also we have here role models. So uh, we have people that already have opportunities uh, to grow up in terms of uh, social, in terms of uh, scientific. So we use these models to say, okay, you cannot just marry. We, we are showing that you can be something. We, we use that. We also have a um, mobile clinic. We have uh, uh, people that teach these girls how to, uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be a really good women in communities. We are talking about, uh, for example, hygiene. So how they can uh, be more hygienic. So they teach so them everything. Yes, they teach them how So we also have one program that helps the, the, the girls that already are married and have child. So some, because some already married uh, has a child, so they already have a child. So we have uh, uh, mothers, a uh, whole mothers that, go in, that, that they go to the communities and they give talk. So they teach the young ones how to treat and how to better educate uh, the young ones. So that's meaning if you are educating a women, you are educating an uh, entire community. That's good. Thank you, Noreen. You referred to the buffer zone. So I just wanted to ask, I believe, so the buffer zone refers to the communities living around the border of the park. And my understanding is that's about 200,000 people living in and exactly. around the park. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Around 2,000. Maybe just to pivot quickly to Ricardo, um, and, and Ricardo, can you just say, uh, tell me a little bit about how did you learn of the park and how did you come to work and train in the park? What, is that, what has that meant for you? Okay, hello everyone. My name is Ricardo Guta and I work as a research technician in Gorongosa National Park. Um, so uh, uh, I came in Gorongosa, first of all, in 2000. Thirteen, when Gorongosa, when Gorongosa National Park uh, organized the first bio, biodiversity survey, I saw in the newspaper that uh, the park was organizing this big event that uh, they invited uh, international scientists and also national scientists, and they were open also opportunity to young uh, young people that was interested also in science, and that's how I joined to Gorongosa National Park. And as, uh, as uh, Dr. Piotr said, uh, Gorongosa have uh, this incredible ecosystem. And my main role in Gorongosa National Park as a research technician, I, 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 I help in the documentation of, uh, of insects and to understand what, is, what species that we have in the park and what is their, their distribution and what is the, the role of this species in our, in our ecosystem. And bec because Gorongosa is any protected area, uh, is any protected area and that, that Gorongosa is any conservation area that work to protect the biodiversity and help the human development. Uh, that's why we, we also have, for example, in, in, in Gorongosa, the coffee project, it's also one way that park connect with the community because we cannot tell that the community that we don't cut this tree or don't kill the animals without, without 
without give them uh, any support. Yeah. That's why yeah. we have a different program here as Norina mentioned, but uh, there's also the coffee program that uh, we raise, uh, we, we produce coffee in the mountain and people, uh, people that live around the mountain, they do that and because it's a shadow uh, coffee, while they are planting the coffee, they also uh, put any trees that uh, later on uh, become that area, that area become more, more dense in terms of vegetation and we can just bring our species, uh, we can just make that place more diversity in terms of uh, uh, diversity of animals. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Ricardo. Um, yes. And thank you, Norina, as well. Um, the, uh, we have a really, actually, really good question from uh, the audience that I wanted to offer up. Uh, maybe, maybe to start with Peter. Um, so obviously, we, the three of you, are at the lab. So I think it sends a clear message. Even though Gorongosa National Park is a place where people of all sorts of backgrounds can come and learn about nature and biodiversity and have um, sort of an ecotourist type of experience. At its core, Gorongosa has science, right? And you're, you're studying, documenting, discovering biodiversity. But I, uh, we had a question from, uh, it's great, from a reader of uh, Window on Eternity, which was Ed's book um, uh, about his experience the second time he visited Gorongosa National Park. And in fact, some of your photos are featured in this book, Peter. But the question is, um, a, about the history of the park, the Civil War, uh, and the recovery. Um, and I think that's just another fascinating aspect of this park that you can study the biodiversity at the same time. This is an active um, unfolding recovery story. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, Peter. Um, absolutely. Uh, maybe just a little bit of a background uh, about Gorongosa itself, how it became a national park and, and so on. Perfect. So Gorongosa was first designated uh, uh, as, as a, essentially a hunting concession or, or a game park in 1920 uh, by the Portuguese. And it wasn't declared a national park until 1960. And then, of course, we had a period of the, the Civil War uh, that lasted uh, from, uh, uh, from the... Uh, beginning of the independence until about 1992, which resulted in the unfortunate loss of, of, of course, uh, and, and very, very tragic loss of, of human life, but also uh, a big loss of uh, the wildlife population in the park and all the infrastructure that was here before. So when um, the decision was made to restore this park, uh, you know, it, it, at that point, it sounded a little crazy because there was literally almost nothing left here. But the park had a great history. It, it used to have uh, a massive population of, of big uh, charismatic uh, African animals, elephants, lions, antelope, and, and so on. So when the, uh, uh, when the, uh, the, the Carr Foundation uh, signed uh, an agreement, a long-term agreement with the Mozambican uh, government in 2008. Uh, it, you mentioned science, it, it decided to do everything based on science, not on politics, not on people's personal opinions, but on actual research and what has been shown to be an effective approach to conservation. Now, Norina and, and Ricardo already talked about it, uh, the, uh, the, the one very, very important aspect of Grangosa is that this is not simply just a biodiversity uh, 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 restoration project. This, we call Grangosa a, a park for the people. Or, or, and, and so the, the ability to help the communities uh, living around the park and the park becoming an important positive element in their life was almost as important, if not uh, as or more important than the actual restoration. So when we, when, when we started the restoration project, and of course I wasn't here at the very beginning, I only joined the project in 2012, um, but uh, what we found here was, an, was a landscape that was essentially empty, empty of uh, large uh, you know, uh, uh, mammalian uh, fauna, but luckily, the the bulk of the of the ecosystem was pretty much intact. Uh, one of the uh, uh, 
interesting side effects of the of the conflict was that there was no logging, no extraction, uh, no farming happening in the park, which uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I, I allowed this 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 landscape to 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 survive relatively relatively intact. So all we needed is to bring back the animals. So at the very beginning. Um, uh, there was there was uh, uh, quite a bit of, of um, reintroduction of some species. We brought in uh, elephant, uh, uh, buffalo, hippos, uh, mostly from South Africa, to augment the existing populations, which at that time were incredibly low. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, before the war, uh, the the population of elephants was about uh, 2,500 individuals. Right after the war, there were probably fewer than 100. There used to be over 2,000 lions right after the war. Who knows, there were maybe five. So, so that landscape was essentially devoid of, of large mammals. Now, with the combination of this uh, selective reintroduction, uh, making sure that the, uh, the landscape is very well protected from poaching, from in incursion by you know, people, uh, uh, protected from logging and, and illegal um, uh, you know, agriculture. We created this absolutely perfect environment for these, for these animals to bounce back. And we've been measuring our success every two years by conducting aerial surveys of, of animals. And I can just give you a couple of numbers. So for example, and this is one of the greatest uh, uh, recovery stories that I've ever heard. So after the war, uh, we've counted uh, 300 individuals of a big antelope called uh, waterbuck. Right now, when we did our last count, which uh, count which was about uh, uh, well, it was it was two years ago, uh, almost two years ago, we counted, I believe, 54,000, 54,000 in from 300 individuals to 5,400. And the numbers are equally impressive for a lot of other organisms such as uh, impala. Uh, elephant, uh, uh, sable antelope, uh, uh, you, you name it, almost all uh, uh, those big animals bounce back very, very well to the point that we are actually giving our animals away. We are now capturing uh, some of these animals and exporting them to other protected areas in Mozambique to help them bring back uh, their populations. So I can, I can say without you know, sounding biased or, or anything, because these are actual numbers, we have completely restored the spark. The mammalian biomass is now equal, or probably even slightly higher than it was uh, in Gorongosa before the war. The composition, the dynamics of, of uh, the species composition has changed a little bit. There's a little bit of a shift in, in which species are dominant now, versus what, uh, what was dominant uh, before the war. But in terms of the mammalian biomass, the Gorongosa is absolutely thriving. Um, and, and, you know, I, I look also at, at, at Gorongosa from a perspective of, of an entomologist. I'm an entomologist. So um, uh, we, all, we also see this, this, this huge uh, uh, mammalian biomass reflected in other organisms. For example, you know, I, I love dung beetles. Without dung beetles, we would be up to here in dung at this point. Uh, but dung beetles are thriving. We have dung beetles. already recorded, <laughs> we already recorded uh, over 170 species of these insects here, including some species new to science. So they are, uh, Gorongosa dung beetles are doing uh, fantastically. And so do other groups of, of, of insects, grasshoppers, praying mantids, butterflies, and so on. So part of the effort that, that Norina and Ricardo and I uh, uh, are involved in is documenting and understanding the complexity of this ecosystem. And this is actually what we feel is our greatest contribution to half earth and, and, and what, 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 the, uh, what the Wilson Foundation is doing. We are trying to help and create this very, very fine grained map of, of biodiversity uh, of course, you know, in the greater scheme of things, uh, Gorongosa is a relatively small, uh, small area uh, compared to the, the entire globe. But by providing these very, very detailed uh, data on uh, species composition, the interactions between species, their distribution, their relationship of their distribution to other uh, uh, factors, biotic and abiotic, we are helping to, uh, you know, understand 
how we can use this information to uh, prioritize the designation of protected areas for projects like, like Half Earth. So, so we've been doing it systematically uh, since 2012. And uh, when, when we started, the first thing that, that we did was to compile all existing information about Garangosa, what is known biologically about Garangosa. And that was, I, I dug it deep into uh, the existing literature, historical records, collection data, and so on. And I found the earliest records, biological records from Gorongosa from uh, 1906. And these were actually botanical records. Somebody uh, came here and collected a few uh, fern species. So these were the first records from Gorongosa. And then entomologists came because entomologists, entomologists always come and collect things. Uh, and then there was a almost nothing for uh, a dozen or, or so years. Then, and then eventually people started uh, recording all the mammals, mostly so they know what to shoot here. Then nothing happened until um, the uh, late 1960s when a gentleman named uh, Kenneth Tin Tinley came here. Um, he did this fantastic, fantastic work documenting and, and mapping this ecosystem. His work, uh, created essentially a baseline of what we know about this ecosystem. Um, anyway, when we first came here, uh, all that information from 1906 to 2012 amounted to about a thousand species of animals and plants ever recorded uh, from the greater Gorongosa ecosystem, which includes Gorongosa, its buffer zone and surrounding areas. Now, since 2012, uh, we've added over 5,000 species to that list. Uh, so I don't remember, Norina probably knows better what's the current count of, of species, do you remember? Of, uh, of everything. Uh, I think it's uh, more than 6,303. Okay, 6,303 <laughs> species. Uh, so this is a, <laughs> yeah. so it's a threefold, over a threefold, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, six-fold increase in, in the number of species. We estimate uh, that we have probably about 75,000 uh, multicellular organisms in Gorongosa. So we, we are still at the very beginning of this, what is now a very, very steep species accumulation curve. Um, and, but we are accelerating this process. We are using uh, more and more new tools to help us uh, understand the biodiversity of this park. Uh, we, uh, the, the Wilson lab uh, that we are standing next to uh, has uh, just started a, a large scale uh, genetic barcoding uh, process. So we'll be using not only uh, the traditional methods of biodiversity documentation, uh, such as you know, collecting physical specimens and measuring them and so on, but also we'll be uh, trying to uh, include these, these molecular tools um, in that process. Um, and we are also uh, more and more uh, uh, trying to capture the relationships between these organisms. So we want to understand not only what we have, but how all these uh, organisms are connected. Uh, that type of information allows us to, it essentially gives us a predictive power. It, it will allow us eventually to model what will happen to this ecosystem over the next 10, 20, 100,000 years, uh, how it will respond, for example, the climate change, um, and how it will, how it may respond to, uh, you know, e unpredictable events such as, you know, uh, massive uh, weather events or, or uh, introduction of an invasive species, you name it. Uh, so the bigger our data set, the better we are able to manage this park, um, plan uh, and prioritize our conservation action and then respond to those, uh, to those, you know, very, various things that may happen here. That's, yeah, what a great, uh, it's just an amazing, um, the trajectory is really amazing. I want to be able to get to um, the light trap um, behind you and to a little show and tell. Uh, oh, yes. And maybe, yeah, and, and, yeah, and get to the insects. Now, you, you mentioned the, what's going on with the big animals. Maybe if you could take a minute to, uh, some of our, um, our guests, our viewers were particularly interested to learn a little more about the elephants. Uh, and the wild dogs. Can you tell us a little bit about the state of the elephants and the wild dogs in particular? Yes, so elephants, we have, um, I believe we have now uh, about 750, maybe 800 elephants, uh, which is, you know, compared to fewer than 100, uh, that's actually also an incredible, almost an unexpected uh, growth, because as you know, elephants 
live a long time, and they reproduce very, very slowly. Uh, the gestation period of an elephant is, what, two years or so. Uh, and, uh, you know, it takes quite a few years for an elephant to become, uh, to become mature. So going from fewer than 100 to 800 or so uh, in, what, 12 years? That is, uh, you know, that's absolutely remarkable. So the elephants are doing, are doing, they're doing great. Um, wild dogs, we used to have wild dogs in Gorongosa. Uh, the last individual uh, here was seen, I want to say 2004 or something, cool. uh, just one individual. Before, before the conflict, we had quite a few. But then they just simply disappeared. And they didn't disappear per, uh, because of the human action, we speculate that there used to be, that there was um, uh, an epidemic of, of canine distemper that wiped out a lot of, of, uh, of our uh, canids. Uh, so not only the, the wild dogs, but also uh, um, uh, jackals. Uh, it also impacted our hyena population and so on. So what we did uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we decided to reintroduce the wild dogs. And there were two reintroductions. And um, I have to say that they are doing, that do, they are doing great. I don't know, actually, I've, I've actually lost count of how many litters they already have. Uh, the number of, um, of uh, wild dogs has at least doubled already since the introduction. I don't actually know how many, how many, how many wild dogs do we, do we have now? Do you guys know? No, uh, yeah, but, uh, but several packs. Like, oh, at, least, at, least, at least 50. And we've introduced, I think, at first we introduced 14 and then another 10 or 12. So, so wild dogs are doing uh, really, really well. Great. That's, let's, let's, look, let's have a look at some of these insects. And okay. we had a good question. Uh, obviously, uh -huh. we can see you there with lots of insects swarming around you. Um, and it'd mm -hmm. be fun to see what you've attracted. Um, but okay. we did have a question asking what your thoughts are on some of these stories about the insect apocalypse and um, you know I guess overall how you feel insects are doing in the park in particular and since importantly they're the basis for so many mm -hmm. things. Yeah so th there is no question that we are witnessing uh, a significant decline in both the abundance and the richness of, of, of insects in certain areas of the world. Uh, this um, uh, that this entire story came out out of uh, initially from Germany, uh, where it, it's been shown that over the last twenty years, uh, uh, the fauna of insects has declined by about seventy percent, and that was in protected areas. Uh, a similar uh, similar uh, based on more of an anecdotal evidence rather than real data. Similar declines have been seen also in uh, tropical areas such as, such as Costa Rica. So there is a very strong correlation between the decline of insects and the amount of industrial and agricultural development in areas around uh, the places where the, where the insects were, uh, were observed. So yes, it is happening. It is happening especially in areas that are um, in, you know, industrial areas or well-developed areas. In places like Gorongosa, I have to say, well, I haven't been here long enough, but I can tell you that insects are doing great. Uh, I have never seen the numbers of insects that I occasionally see here in Garangosa. So tonight we have a very slow night. So this light has probably what? I don't know, maybe 3,000 insects right now. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, the night is young and, and the, the, the moon is bright. So there are very, very few. But there are nights here where this, you wouldn't be able to see that, that, that white sheet. It would be literally covered with insects. We had situation we had to fold the light because we were afraid that this thing will collapse under the white weight of insects. So, but this, why is that? Because we are in a protected area surrounded by a buffer zone where there is no use of pesticides, at least not a wide, widespread use of pesticides. There's no a large scale industrial activity. So this ecosystem is pretty much as intact as it gets. So there, there are no factors that would limit the, uh, the, these insect populations. So the insects here and in places like this are probably still doing great. 
So if we want to reverse that negative trend that we are seeing in, in the de developed part of the world, we essentially have to make those areas as similar to natural ecosystem, uh, ecosystems as possible. And I just wanted to make here a little plug um, uh, against something, a, a phenomenon that is so incredibly popular in the, in the US, and this is uh, essentially an ecological disaster, which is the traditional American lawn. The, 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 the tradition of, of maintaining these sterile green deserts in front of everybody's house has done so much, so much damage by application of pesticides, by eliminating native, native flora and thus the uh, you know, habitats for native insect species. If we can reverse the trend and convince people that rather than having this, this sterile uh, green lawn, uh, you have a meadow consisting of, you know, your native native plant species. Then you immediately every street becomes a wildlife corridor, and first you will start, uh, you know, seeing pollinators coming back, uh, other insects coming back. Then you will st start seeing more and more birds, songbirds, and 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 uh, you know, amphibians, reptiles, and so on. And and so you essentially will have this you know, this beautiful wildlife corridor and many uh, nature reserve pretty much everywhere where there's a spot to, to plant some, some, some plants. Yeah, we have, so, a, anyway. we, yeah, um, um, uh, yeah, do you have some, uh, anything interesting that you can pluck so, off? I, I, want, <laughs> I want Ricardo to show you, I want Ricardo to show you this animal and tell you something about it. Um, and then I want Marina to show you an, a different insect. So Ricardo, why don't you sit and don't show us the dance? <laughs> so we have this, we have this, this beetles. That is a rhino beetles. I don't know if you are able oh, to see. A rhino beetle, uh-huh. Rhino beetles that we have in Gorongos. And I'm gonna show you another thing. So <clears throat> talking about the uh, documentation, uh, of biodiversity in Gorongosa. This is uh, also one result. This is a candidate okay. that was described uh, last year. It's a, it's a new for science from, from Gorongosa. It's Parapricia gaitonai. Ah. was described last year. Did you discover this? The, the, yes, the species? It, it was dis discovered and described by Ricardo. <laughs> Ricardo, <laughs> you got to name it. That's so great. Yeah. Yeah. So, Marina, I'm going to explain a little bit about Okay. All right, so Ricardo, Ricardo is a grasshopper specialist. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And Narina, I know you're an ant specialist, but that is, uh, I, that's not an ant. It's <laughs> <laughs> not an ant. I'm so sorry. Wow. So Beautiful. this one, I, as you can see, it's uh, the hugest one, uh, rhinoceros beetle that we have. Yeah. So it's really uh, strong, and this one feeds on a palm tree. So it has... Uh, oh. Yes, as uh, Dr. Peter was saying, I really like also the, the beetles because I also consider it as a recycle because without them, we should have, a, we could have a lot of dung here. So, and also one of the things that the people don't uh, realize it's the behavior of rolling dung. So normally <laughs> when we see uh, two specimens rolling the dung, usually it's a female and male. Oh. So, so they build the, uh, the ball entire entire of dung and then they choose a spot. So they will open a hole and then they will pull the dung. But before they put it back the soil, they put an egg. So the dung is just to provide the uh, good um, environment to the young baby growing up. And after the rain, and the, the, the young one will come out uh, as adults. So, so this is really cooperative good. pair bonding with uh, yeah. dung beetle. How many, how many species of, of rhinoceros beetle are there? You know? Um, I don't have uh, the exactly number, but, but we have a uh, quite few. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I think we have about uh, 20 species that belong to this subfamily, which is called Dynastiny. That's great. So, you know, we had some questions, people, um, you know, we talked a little bit in the introduction about the, um, you know, the relationship with the community of the park. We have, we have um, some questions people concerned about human population. And I, I would say the most general theme of this is, is humans and nature living together. 
Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you could say a word about that. And then some folks are also concerned or want to know how things are going in this time of pandemic and, and how the, the local, the park and the local community is doing. Uh, okay, with, with uh, maybe I'll start with that. Um, so, so thankfully, Mozambique has not been impacted uh, uh, heavily by, uh, by the virus. Uh, there are relatively very, very few, few cases in the entire country and no fatalities, which is just absolutely fantastic news. Uh, there have been no cases reported from our region. However, we are, we are getting ready. Uh, we are in quarantine here, essentially. The park is closed. Uh, there are no visitors uh, other than us. There are, there are no visiting scientists. And, um, but, but we are uh, in the state of preparedness. Uh, one of the things that we do here uh, we are working closely with the communities. One of the things that we're doing, uh, for example, we, we converted our uh, lecture hall into um, a, a factory that makes masks, uh, which we then distribute to communities. Uh, we have our own um, health program, which is uh, part of our uh, center for uh, community education and, and uh, our community uh, relations program. Uh, so, so our healthcare professionals work with the communities. They are, they are watching, they are educating them about the prevention measures. We are distributing things like uh, disinfectants. Uh, we are uh, uh, dis distributing masks and so on. So uh, if um, anything happens, which hopefully it will not, we will be ready. We will be probably more ready than a lot of other places. Uh, so that's, that's, that's that about, uh, about the, uh, the virus. Uh, now, I already mentioned earlier that we consider this park uh, the park for the people. And uh, uh, as you uh, mentioned, the, the overpopulation, uh, human impact, also human animal conflict and so on, is a major issue, uh, not only in Gorongosa, but in a lot of uh, places on the globe in a, in a lot of protected areas. So. Norina spoke uh, about uh, girls clubs and uh, keeping uh, girls in school, education of, of girls and so on. And this is one of the very important things that we're doing here. We are putting a lot of emphasis on education, um, uh, education at every, every level from the youngest kids uh, who come here. We literally get thousands of kids uh, come here to Gorongosa and learn about the park through uh, all these, all these uh, intermediate levels up to a higher education. Uh, and one of the major, major components of it is keeping uh, young girls in schools, uh, uh, education about their reproductive rights, education, uh, essentially empowering them to be able to shape their own, own futures. Uh, we are hoping that uh, we will be in that, in that way, we'll be able to allow them to make their own decision as to when they want to have kids, how many kids they want to have and so on, which will in turn uh, lessen the impact of uh, pressure of the population on protected areas. Um, we are also working very closely with communities uh, in terms of um, um, improving their capacity to, uh, to generate income and produce food. We have our own uh, agriculture de de department that uh, uh, introduces uh, various um, uh, uh, sustainable agriculture uh, techniques. We, we provide people with, you know, seeds, and know-how, tools, and so on, uh, that allows them to dramatically improve the productivity uh, of their fields, and thus again reduce the impact and pressure on on the protected areas. Uh, we are also working with the communities to lessen the um, the human animal conflict. You know, as the population of elephants grow, they also want to eat and they, they like smell maize. that field of maize that is just right across the river and they really want it. So we are working with communities, first of all, uh, by uh, uh, designing their agriculture practices so they are a little further away, that there are natural barriers between them and, and the wildlife of Gorongosa. And also uh, our rangers, um, if you know, something like that happens and the elephants crosses the river, goes into the community, our rangers go there and herd them back into the park. And we're using all kinds of really cool techniques uh, to limit the, uh, uh, the exposure of, of, of the communities around the park to our wildlife. Uh, we are experimenting with uh, uh, different um, ways of keeping elephants in the park. Uh, we have uh, this fantastic uh, Mozambican student 
uh, named Dominique Gonsalva, uh, Gonsalves, uh, who is now doing her PhD in the UK. And one of the things that she's working on is the uh, different ways of uh, uh, keeping the Gorongosa elephant population in the park and lessening their impact on the on the communities. So there are many, many different ways in which we uh, we work with the communities. Uh, first of all, to improve their livelihood uh, 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 based on what what the park uh, provides, and also uh, making sure that this this interaction, this this this. Uh, uh, interface of human population, the animal population is is very very peaceful. I also want to mention one more thing, which is um, uh, we recently started a, a project uh, uh, of uh, growing our own Gorongosa coffee, uh, and and this is the reason why we decided to do that is kind of multi pronged. First of all, uh, we needed a way of quickly and effectively reforest uh, Mount Gorongosa, which is essentially the only area in Gorongosa that suffered quite a bit from deforestation, mostly from slash and burn agriculture. So we needed to give, uh, we, we needed to uh, be able to reforest that place very, very quickly. We also needed to give the local population there an alternative to the slash and burn agriculture and this very low productivity uh, agriculture that they, were, that they were used to. Shade grown coffee was just probably the, the best solution we, uh, uh, th th that exists uh, to this problem. The climate there, the soil there is absolutely perfect for coffee. There's no tradition of growing coffee in Mozambique. So we, that, this was a, a, a trailblazing enterprise and, and it's, it's bearing fantastic fruits. And you can actually sample those fruits. Uh, if you go to our gorongosacoffee.org uh, 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 website, uh, .com website uh, you can you can get that coffee, and it's a really really get good coffee. And you know, I know my coffee. Um, so anyway, and and that uh, pretty much 100% of the uh, profit from uh, from that enterprise goes directly into the park, into things like uh, girls club, uh, healthcare, uh, and it also gives. Uh, these local far farmers a serious injection of cash uh, that allows them in turn to send their kids to school, to buy new equipment, to invest more in their in their uh, in their farms and, and houses and so on. So it's a it's it's a truly uh, a, a very successful uh, project. Yeah, thanks so much, Peter. Um, I'd like to turn to to Paula Ehrlich now, who um, who to make a few more comments about. Um, the Half Earth Project connection to the park and your your role as uh, as our chair, uh, Paula. Please. Sure. We you know you mentioned a little earlier um, a book called Window on Eternity. Um, that book was actually uh, written in 2014 by E. O. Wilson um, and Peter joined him in creating the photos for it. And and somewhat presciently, given the moment that we're in today, Ed wrote in the book about our quest for eternity. And the idea that our immortality resides in those remnants of the natural world that we've not yet destroyed, specifically in extraordinary places like Gorongosa. Um, and, and Ed reminds us in the book that we should first of all take constant pleasure from the surprise, the mystery, the awe, the wholeness, the relief, and the redemption that places like Gorongosa offer, which is really wonderful to see this evening. Um, he also highlights, as we've gotten a glimpse of today, how Gorongosa is a model for how we can best protect these sanctuaries of our transcendent heritage and provide the quality of human life everywhere. So it's been really exciting over the years and again here today to showcase Gorongosa as a model, really, for all we must do to achieve a half-Earth future. Um, the foundation, the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation and Half-Earth Project are committed to promoting model field research that builds a more comprehensive database of the Earth's vast biodiversity and then uses it as a fundamental tool for the management of places for conservation. Um, so we were really proud to have Peter and Ricardo lead the way as our inaugural Half Earth Chair and Scholar. Now, our Half Earth Chairs and Scholars program brings Ed's vision for Half Earth to life by supporting research efforts to better understand the biodiversity of our world. 
Um, and our ambition is for chairs and scholars in each region of the world to provide leadership around the unique socioeconomic needs and conservation priorities of their region of the world, um, increasing the global footprint, the depth of academic rigor and the regional scientific insight um, needed to successfully reach the goal of Half Earth. So we're, we're just thrilled to have Peter's leadership on the Half Earth project team um, and really excited about the way that his unique scientific understanding, research and teaching expertise are supporting uh, conservation management and next generation stewardship in Mozambique and really as a model for Africa and the rest of the world. That's uh, terrific. Thanks so much, Paula. Well, we have so many good questions. So what, what I wanted to do at this point um, is uh, encourage anyone who didn't get their question answered to reach out to us. We'd love to engage with you after the fact. This, will, this, um, uh, this uh, uh, cocktail hour will be available um, to view on demand. Um, so I wanna, I'll say hello to the on-demand audience right now. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. In fact, I'll, I'll just, you can email me at dliu at eowilsonfoundation.org, but it's easy to find our website. We'll post it at the end of the program. Um, and uh, uh, so there'll be a, a variety of ways that you can reach out to us and we can try and answer so, so many of the great questions that we didn't get to. Um, I wanted to just ask one more question before we need to wrap up. Um, you know, because we're in front of a light trap, we could hear the insects. I thought it would be fun to hear a little bit from Peter and Ricardo about their work with acoustical monitoring of insect populations. Um, in our last couple of minutes, uh, do you have any, anything to say about that, uh, Peter and Ricardo? Ricardo will say something. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, acoustic uh, acoustic is a is a part of uh, communication of insects. We know, as we know, insects have a different form to communicate. Some of them use a visual and uh, nocturnal, and some diurnal insect like uh, grasshopper and katydid uh, and also cricket. They 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 communicate by by sound. And they do that sometimes to, to find their, their mates. And sometimes also, uh, it's, uh, sometimes they, they do that also to, 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 to find, uh, to, to, to compete. To, how can I say? They do that sometimes also to, it's uh, territorial. Uh, they, they do that is to mark their, 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 their territory. And, by sound, sound uh, acoustic uh, documentation is very important because uh, in Gorongosa we are using uh, different tools for collecting insects and sometimes it's difficult to, to go in some place because uh, it because, uh, can be very closed but if they are singing we can record and use different tools in the lab and to identify this species and we also can 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 construct the baselines of acoustic insects in in, in Gorongosa, and uh, how can I say is uh, everybody that uh, every tourist and other people that come in Gorongosa, they expect to to hear during the night insects and other things, and sometimes people do lab to, people do tourism during the night, and they hear some insects and frogs and they don't know what is the species and they can just use uh, their cell phone to record and then uh, bring to us and because we already record some, we, we can be able to, to say the, the name of, uh, of, of the species. Uh, and sound is also very important tools for monitoring uh, the species. For example, monitoring, first of all, the sound and uh, the, the sound help us to understand the distribution of the species. For example, if we, if we record and we already know that uh, this be the name of the species, we can start recording in different place in the park and to understand what is the distribution of that species. And then we can just uh, use this information to monitoring uh, the, 
the dynamic of that species in the in in in, in Gorongosa ecosystem. Uh, I think Dr. Peter can explain a little bit more about the sound. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I think Ricardo covered it pretty well. Uh, I just I just want to uh, mention very quickly in the, the last uh, <laughs> minutes. Um, some of the practical application of, of the sound uh, that, that, uh, uh, that we are uh, using here, uh, uh, the application for the sound recordings. So what we are trying to do, do now is, is to implement a, a wide uh, um, a network of automated recorders that will allow us to monitor the, the, the presence and the dynamics of species in the park. Uh, so we'll be able to detect the, for example, an arrival of a species of, of, of a bird or a frog or an insect that we haven't had before. Uh, alternatively, you will be able to to monitor uh, changes in the in the density of the population of those species. Such tools are also useful for detecting human activity. I mean, if you can record a bird, you can also record a chainsaw or a gunshot. So this will also allow us to uh, to uh, do a slightly better job in detecting you know human incursion on the uh, on the park if if it happens. Um, we are also using these, these acoustic tools uh, to monitor for presence of, of, of organisms that may have potentially uh, uh, health-related uh, impact. Uh, we have created a library of ultrasonic acoustic signatures of all our bat species. Uh, so now we don't have to catch them anymore. All we have to do is just put out a, an a ultrasonic uh, recorder and we know exactly what type of of bat uh, species are present in a village or that cave or, or whatnot. And of course, uh, Ricardo and I, we are using uh, these, these acoustic signatures to detect uh, new and undescribed species of, of insects, such as grasshoppers and crickets and hadididids. Uh, so it's, it's a, a very, very exciting tools that we are both using. And you can probably notice that Ricardo essentially has these headphones grafted to his oh, neck, his <laughs> goes everywhere and, and records, <laughs> records everything uh, where, wherever he goes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's awesome. Well, so, I mean, it's such a great example, you know, use every tool available. What a, what a great um, setting for all of that. Um, so I think we're going we're gonna to wrap up now um, and uh, thank everyone. We had, we had about, um, we had uh, nearly 200 uh, participants uh, at our peak. So I want to thank you, Peter, Ricardo, Narina. Thank you, Paula. I also want to thank the sort of the support team behind the scenes, Amy, Marshall, Chris, and Nicole. And I'm sorry if I've forgotten anyone. Um, Ed, Ed, Ed Wilson's book came up a few times, Window on Eternity. Um, it is a great personal sort of almost like a diary of what it was like for Ed to be in the park in 2011 and 2012. Has some beautiful photos by Peter. And I want to close with just one quote that really, um, really took me from the book. Um, in 2012, Peter and uh, Ed and another ent entomologist, Gary Alpert, were part of an a entomological expedition in the park. And so this is from Ed's diary um, of uh, the date was um, May, in fact, May 20th. So just coming up in, in the year. And Ed's, Ed writes, not a day for rest. The, uh, there never is in doing field work with so many exciting discoveries filling every day. Our collecting of ants and arthopterans continues. Most notably, Gary Alpert and Peter Nazrecki encounter a grove of fever trees, which you mentioned earlier, Peter, through which elephants had passed an hour or so previously, knocking down some of the medium-sized trees the opportunity presented itself to collect ants living in the canopy. So Gary and Peter, keeping their eyes open for elephants, work through the newly accessible upper twi twigs and branches. They discover several arboreal species not previously seen. And I think that just beautifully encapsulates um, the experiences you can have in the park. Um, it encapsulates uh, Ed Wilson and that notion of a, down, a tree knocked down by an elephant is an opportunity to collect ants from the top of the tree that you couldn't otherwise. Um, so anyways, I wanna thank you so much. Uh, we had so many questions that we couldn't um, answer. I hope that we can perhaps have another cocktail hour in a, different, in a different season. I wish you all the best and I wanna thank everyone for participating in this. Super, well, thank Thanks. you so much, Dennis. Thank you, Paula. It was a pleasure. Wonderful to see you all. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.